Welcome to the Inspirational Living Podcast, brought to you by the kind financial support of listeners like you. Become our patron for as little as $3 a month to gain access to the weekly series, Our Sunday Talks, which focuses on topics related to spirituality and spiritual growth. Learn more at livinghour.org forward slash Sunday. Today's reading was edited and adapted from Adventures in Common Sense by Dr. Frank Crane, published in 1916. There is one question upon whose answer rests the success or failure of life. It is the question, why was I born? A strange fact is that nobody knows the answer. The purpose which the Creator had in mind when it made me and you has never been known, never will be known. Curious that the most fateful of all problems should be forever unanswerable. We may believe this or that to be the reason why we were created, but we cannot know. Notwithstanding this fact, the net result of my life depends upon the theory I form to answer this query. But how can I tell which theory is best? when there is no means of knowing which one is true. Well, there is a way to tell which theory is, if not true, at least approximately true. This way is suggested by what is called pragmatism. That is to say, the answer most likely to be true is the one which will work. We cannot answer the question, why was I born? by investigating causes. The secrets of life are beyond us. The Creator will not be interviewed. But we can select an answer by noting results. For instance, you might say I was made in order that I might get all the pleasure possible out of life. But this solution means wreckage. Its fallacy is proved by the addictions, madness, adulteries, and heartbreaks that constantly attend the end of the pleasure seeker. How about, I was made in order that I might escape this evil world and get safely into a better one after death? Such an answer leads logically to the asceticism that marked the Dark Ages and the hard morbidity that characterized Puritanism. Meanwhile, I was born to labor for others, means a race of slaves. I was born to live and to enjoy myself upon the fruits of others' labor, means a class of snobs. The most satisfactory answer in 21st century terms is, I was born to express what forces my Creator planted in me, to develop my instincts and talents under the guidance of reason, to find permanent happiness by fostering the higher, more altruistic, and spiritual impulses, and by subduing the violence of the more brutal ones. I was born to find love in my own work, and through these liberty. In one word, The purpose of creating me was that I should be as great as possible. Only by this answer do we find strength without cruelty, virtue without narrowness, beauty without effeminacy, love without contamination, reverence without superstition, joy without excess. I do not know this answer is correct. I believe it to be the most nearly correct for the simple reason that it works. In addition, there is an intelligent optimism which I hold, and there are several varieties of fool optimism that I have eschewed. There is a theological optimism that claims to have proved 
that this is the best possible world. It is a hopefulness built on logic and is rather unconvincing to the modern mind. There is also a kind of self-willed optimism, an assumption that all is well whether it's well or not, a postulating, assertive optimism that grins even at funerals from a sense of duty. People of this cold are rather trying too hard. They are always telling you that all is for the best, when you know very well that certain things are for the worst. Intelligent optimism, however, does not declare that all is good, including the devil and disease, but it asserts that the general law of progress is upward, that there is much good in things as they are, that it is conducive to our comfort and efficiency to let our minds dwell upon that rather than upon the evil, and that we are capable of making things better and thus propose to do so. Our confidence in the constant improvement of the world is not a matter of faith. We do not need to shut our eyes, cross our fingers, and repeat a creed. Our assurance is based upon knowledge. An understanding of history, of the conditions of society in former times compared to this time, and of the steady growth of liberty and civil rights forms the foundation of our conclusion. Further ground for our hopefulness consists in our realization that it is in our power to improve the world we live in. We have learned that human welfare grows, not only by providence, but also by our own efforts. By organized exertion, we have overturned tyrannies, abolished slavery, removed plagues, and rendered life in the 21st century a hundred times more agreeable than it was in the 18th. What we have done, we can continue to do. We can go on improving our state. We can produce wealth less wastefully and distribute profits more fairly. We can raise the condition of the worker, liberate the oppressed, give children better educations, curb loaded fortunes and wealth combinations, take better care of our unfortunates, and do much toward preventing crime and poverty. We no longer look to kings and nobles to do those things for us. We no longer merely pray and hope for the deity to do them. We are conscious of the ability to help along our country and communities by our own activities, hence our optimism. But optimism is not only a logical affair, it is a state of mind, a temperamental product. Wherever you find health, vigor, and work, you find optimism. Pessimism is a secretion of a morbid mind, of weakness, anemia, or idleness. We are optimists because we are better fed, housed, and clothed, have more books and information, have the remedy for social wrongs in our own hands, in the agency of democracy, and in short, have a faith and joy in life and its possibilities not based upon tradition or authority, but upon facts, upon instincts, and upon the consciousness of our own strength. That is why we optimists front the future with our morning faces of good cheer, and refuse to melt in fear at the alarms of the calamity howlers. The ironic thing is that the howlers are often those who most pride themselves on their education. They fail to realize that the most striking thing about a really learned person is not the extent of their knowledge, but the extent of their admitted ignorance. The wiser a person is, the greater number of things they don't know. The more universally cocksure and well-informed one seems, 
the more likely it is that they are full of nonsense. Socrates, whom the oracle pronounced wisest of all, often used to say he knew nothing. How little has science made inroads into the larger questions of nature and humanity, such as, how is it that a huge oak is all enfolded in a little acorn? How can nature make the peach full of juice and cased so closely in the thinnest of fuzzy skin that it never leaks? How does the body here create a hard fingernail, there a hair, and there a stony tooth? What is life? What is that secret force that transforms in a moment a living dog who eats his environment into a dead dog whose environment eats him? What is love? Why does this woman or man thrill you and that one leave you cold or repel you? What is conscience? That world's policeman that urges us on to what we think right and afflicts us when we do wrong. What is truth? What is personality? What is being? And these questions are not remote academic questions, not such things as the biologist Thomas Huxley once called lunar politics. They touch the very nearest and dearest regions of every person's life. We are but angel dust in the sunbeam of the infinite. We cling like oysters to our little point in the bed of the vast ocean of mystery. All about us is nature, deep-wombed, gray-eyed, her mind a galaxy of secrets, her thoughts far and strange as the procession of the suns. Nothing befits us, her children, so much as reverence for her purposes, humility before her great brain, trust and love in her vast heart. No one is so consummate an ass as the one who thinks they know it all. Let me finish today's talk with one last question. When people are married, we often hear, What could he or she see in the other? Is it that love gives a deeper insight and sees a worth really there? Or does it merely overheat the fancy to imagine a worth not there at all? There are few questions of deeper concern to thousands than this, so let me try to offer an answer. For practical purposes, for living one's life in peace and happiness, it is more important to know about the laws of love than the laws of chemistry or of the United States. Love is not a delusion. Love is the only thing that can see truth. That is true not only in the relation of men and women, but everywhere else. The reason Thomas Edison was a wizard at invention was not only because of his genius, but also because he loved his laboratory work. No person can handle a horse who does not love a horse. The best cook is the best lover of cooking. The greatest baseball player is the most tremendous lover of the game, other things being equal. The best novelist or story writer is the one who most wholly loves the characters they create. The best actor is the greatest lover of their art. There is only one potency. It is love. There is only one vision. It is love. There is only one wisdom. It is love. There is only one religion. It is love. You cannot get anything out of a book unless you love it. You cannot teach children unless you love them. Money by itself has never done any permanent good in the world. 
one loving heart outweighs all the gifts of Carnegie and Rockefeller in its results on the welfare of humankind. Love sees, it is not blind. Indifference is blind. The cold heart is blind. There is only one tragedy. It is when love dies. Love creates. Coldness is impotent. Love has that faith, trust, which saves the world, while intellect has doubts which can unravel the world. The devil, Mephistopheles, according to Goethe, is pure intellect. He, quote, never loved a human soul. But God, says the Bible, is love. This earth was made for lovers, and those who love not though they be walking about, are not really living. The Inspirational Living Podcast is a production of The Living Hour. Transform your life in 30 days with our Majesty Meditation Program. Get 30% off the $11.99 purchase price with the coupon code INSPIRATION. Learn more at livinghour.org forward slash majesty. Thanks for listening. I look forward to talking with you next time.